I can say, yo, they can ask me, did I see Keefe D? Yes, I did. Was he around? Yes, he was. In what capacity was he around? Gambling, having fun, drinking, and talking. Did he ever did security? No, he did not. Now, did he use his manpower, his dudes around him, around us, and people could thought they was a part of us? Yes, they were. It made us seem like we had Crips with us doing security. It made it seem like it, but they wasn't. They was there to have fun and chill. Now, if something jump off, would they have done something? Maybe they would have. If they want me, if they want me to testify, if they want me to testify, I'm going to testify. Now, John Deal is prepared to testify against his former employer as long as he gets sent to jail and justice is served. Speaking of Harvey Pierre, how do you feel about him getting accused of sexual assault? Uh, like I said, anything that has to do with those sexual assaults, those people have to prove that. But is it, are they capable? Yeah, they're capable. Guys don't put those pills that they get to the girls in the champagne bottles because they popping them in front of them. Most of those girls, especially if they like mixed drinks, you understand, they see the bottles when they open them and they trying to keep their eyes on because they don't want to get no kind of drugs put in their system. But what they don't understand is in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. They didn't put the pills and the stuff in there, the roofies, the ecstasy, the ease, all, whatever they, they put it in the juice. Now, those girls who like the mixed drinks, you understand what I'm saying? They gonna pour their own sexual act because they don't understand it ain't in the bottles, it's in the juice. Those guys, they learn that. The man's ready to spill all of Diddy's dirty little tricks and secrets. When it comes to Biggie's murder, do you think Diddy should be held accountable? No doubt. I didn't think that way, you know, because I'm too, I too was traumatized in a way, to be totally honest. When you pull somebody out the car and they done pissed and they done shit on themselves, and you know you got that dead weight in your hand and you got to sit down there and tell this man, mother, you know, what you heard, what you saw after this dude that lied to his mother. That's trauma, bro. I don't give, I don't care how hard you is. And Biggie ain't the only dude that I've seen get murdered in a party, at a party, or being murdered. But he's the only one that I had to grab in my hands and carry and help put him on a, a gurney, a stretcher. He's the only one that I got to constantly hear his music on the radio. He's the only one that I can't get Miss Wallace out of my mind when she grabbed both of my hands and said, I don't want to hear no more with tears in her eyes, man. To have an experience like that for probably and arguably the world's greatest rapper of all time, that's crazy, bruh. So now, He's responsible for not having enough security. He's responsible for having big there. He's responsible for not listening to security by telling them, if we go to this party, one of us going to die tonight. Somebody going to get killed tonight. He owed Ms. Wallace. He owed Ms. Wallace. And I didn't feel that way at first until I heard it said on another YouTube show.
when Clark Kent said that Big told him the only reason he was going to that party is because D-Rock and Puff set it up for them to go. And you said when you got Biggie out the court, he was what? My man, he had urinated and he had shit. And you heard Puff lie a couple of times in the past. I didn't know. I didn't know. Nobody told us. We was just young. You knew. You knew. You heard him lie as if he didn't know. And then he put his boys, Mark Pitts and Wayne Barrow, right over there in Ms. Wallace's ear. Whereas that she should have been filing a lawsuit against Clyde Davis and Arista and Bad Boy Records for the death of her son. Because they did not have the proper security for the notorious B. In the height of what was determined the East Coast, West Coast war. Now, he's even pushing for Biggie's mom to sue Diddy for his involvement in her son's murder. The, the actual level of violence has been very shocking to people to watch any man do that to a woman, uh, particularly a very high profile man doing it in such brazen public manner in a, in a public place like that was even more shocking uh, that he had no compulsion about doing this where there may be cameras. But was that indicative of Diddy's general behavior towards women? Uh, in, 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 in my light, I would say yes. In my light, I would say yes. It didn't surprise me when I saw it because I've seen things to this nature before. I've gotten in between things of this nature before. And this was back in 2012. So that's why I was so adamant on what I said yesterday after he posted that apology, because it comes a time where it's like, you can't just say anything you want to say and think that people are going to accept it. You know what I'm saying? I think, I think it's a God syndrome, you know, the same way that he's been in a lot of trouble before and you could pay your way out. He knew those cameras was there, you know, but of course, as we heard, he came back to the hotel and he paid to get the footage, mm. but didn't know which Cassie said inside a complaint that they gave her a copy of the footage also. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So when you go through life just paying your way out, I really feel like he wasn't sorry about that. Yeah, he might be sorry now. He's sorry that he got caught. But if that was a one time incident, then I would say accept his apology. But I think. In that apology, he said what he thought people wanted to hear. How many times did you personally witness him be violent towards women? Uh, around four or five times. And was that all with Cassie or was it Cassie and other women? Uh, I seen him with Cassie and I seen him with Kim Porter, his uh, kid's mother. Right, who's now so sadly no longer with us. But what, what did you see him do? Uh, I've, I've seen them get physical. I've seen him get really physical, grab them up. It was one time that Cassie mentioned inside her lawsuit where she said she had to go over to the London Hotel. Mm. I was the one that was checking on her every day at the London Hotel. You know what I'm saying? So I know that to be true. I've seen him get into some rustling and punching matches. And sometimes I felt like, what are you mad at? What are you upset about? Because it's it's a deeper anger when you hitting and punching a woman in that type of manner. And it's okay, it's, it's, it's understood if you have a problem with one woman and you seek things, but when you have a problem with every woman that you're dealing with, then I think that problem is inside of you. What did you see him do with Kim Porter? I seen him inside the car, grab her up. I seen him smack her, you know? And one thing about Kim is, Kim got to the point where she fought back because she realized how powerful she was. It was one incident on Sunset Boulevard in front of the Beverly Hills Hotel where I just seen the car rocking back and forth. You know, of course he put everybody out the car, but I seen the car shaking, so I opened the door. I said, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? 
You see where we at? And what are you doing? And Kim got out the car like nothing happened. And she fixed her hair and she told him, she said, I want to see you explain to the media that scratch I'm going to put across your face if you put your hands on me again. Mm. And that, that, was, that was Kim attitude. Kim attitude was she realized that what he had to explain meant more to him than anything. And once she realized she had that power, she said, nah, not no more. Because you're going to have to explain why you all mocked up. Yet another bodyguard goes on the Piers Morgan show to inform everybody of Diddy's violent activities towards his female partners. I mean, you know, when I watched it, what stood out to me initially after Elizabeth Wagmeister got it was she's barefoot in the beginning. And it's like she was so quickly running out of the room to get to, to the elevator that she didn't even put her shoes on yet. I mean, that's terror. That's what you would do if there was a fire. Right? You would just run out, grab what you could. So I can only imagine looking at that, the fear that she felt she had to get out of that room and bare feet in order to be safe or protect herself. I mean, you worked closely with him. I did. I was his assistant between 2008 and 2009, and they were dating when I worked for him. And what was, well, what was he like? And what, were, what did you observe about them at this time? I observed nothing that would lead me to believe, or there was no scuttlebutt about it. I never saw him speak harshly to her or be abusive toward her or anything like that. I rode in the limos with them. I went to parties with them. Um, I guess what I would say is, even though I never saw anything that could corroborate what's in that lawsuit and what we just saw, there was not one cell in my body that was surprised. Why not? You know, it's going to sound a little bit weird because I don't have any facts, right? And nobody's going to call me to testify. But I would say that it's woman's intuition. I would say that I was around him a lot and I got a feeling for who he was. I didn't see anything um, that could get him in trouble. But I think that the, the power dynamic in a situation like that, especially her at the beginning of her career, so young and beautiful and talented, and she hooked herself or became involved with somebody who had so much power. And I felt that working for him. I'm sure the whole team felt that. And I mean, that's right. He's a mogul. So of course he's the big boss. But I think that you could imagine, certainly in my interactions with him, you could imagine how that would dissipate and, and sort of seep into every aspect of his life and especially his relationships. Yeah, because I mean, she was 19, I believe, and he was 37 when they first began dating. Right. So imagine how that would be. And then he's rich. And not only is he rich, but he controls your career. And all you want in your career, right, is she's an artist. She wants to make music. She really was an artist, is an artist. And now all of a sudden, she's with somebody who could make that happen for her. And it doesn't happen. So you don't, you don't, it wasn't anything specific. You just, you got a strange, uncomfortable feeling from him? I mean, or? it was, I think it's more to do with the way that he treated people. Again, nobody was mistreated that I saw. I didn't feel mistreated, but it was very clear to me. Again, this is intuition, right? This is what we pick up as women and mm -hmm. humans who are smart and have been around. He just didn't see your humanity when he looked at you. I felt, it felt very obvious to me that everyone was just sort of there to be used, that he can get the most out of you. You know, for example, I went to go work for him. I'm a pretty senior person. It was sort of an odd thing. I have a fancy master's degree, whatever, who cares? Um, but it was, you know, he wanted to get me for as cheaply as he could. And most people would just dive in and take it, right? Because you think that you're gonna get something by working for him. News channels are also entertaining Diddy's former assistant now that she's ready to speak out against him. It was only a matter of time that more people that have seen things, heard things, that have worked closely with Sean Diddy Combs would start speaking out. And his longtime assistant is also speaking out. So I just posted yesterday that Diddy's head of security, former head of security, Roger Bonds, who was named in Cassie's lawsuit, also spoke out. You can see full videos of this on my YouTube. So Diddy's longtime assistant, Capricorn Clark, posted this on her private Twitter saying, Black women end up being the sacrifice for the effery. Last 11 years of my life had to deal with everyone's nonsensical allegiance to the devil. I pray that ends. I don't think highly of any of you. Can't keep your head down. Plus, pretend-ish is cool no more. 
do better. Then she posts a quote saying, they will skin you and wear you, baby girl, then pretend they never wanted the skin. Kim was the only person who didn't switch up. The only one dark times. I'm personally very triggered. I pray it's over. I never deserve this. Stop. Another longtime assistant, Support Clark, has also decided to chime in. Diddy's ex-chef suing for actual harassment and more, but jury won't hear the case. He was sued by his former chef for actual misconduct and non-payment of overtime. However, the courts would not hear her case. So this right here, it says, Diddy's former personal chef settles work claims suit with the rapper. So this was published in 2019 and it says Diddy's former personal chef who says she was subjected to actual harassment and forced to work long hours without being fully compensated for overtime settled the lawsuit she filed against the entertainer. The attorneys in the case told a judge Tuesday in her suit filed in May of 2017 against the 49 year old defendant whose real name is Sean Combs plaintiff Cindy Ruta alleged that she often worked long hours and traveled with him sometimes for up to two weeks without receiving any additional pay. She says she was hired in April of 2015 and fired in May of 2016. She said it was very hostile over there. Things was a little bit too cray cray and she was not here for it. It says, as an example, Ruta stated that in August of 2015, she arrived late because of traffic and that Diddy present with house guest Gina. Gina. Remember, we talked about Gina yesterday, and that's the girl that said that he stumped her, beat her and was hitting her in the head on the side and in the back and all of that. Yeah, if you didn't catch my video yesterday, make sure you catch it because we had all the tea. So she said, baby, Diddy was there and Gina was there. The last girl who alleged that he put the paws on her and all of this and all of that. So she said that she was late because of traffic and that Diddy, who was present with house guest Gina, yelled in obscenity at her, then asked, can't you see I have company? Ruta says she apologized to Diddy and Gina and that singer told her immediately to prepare breakfast and serve it in his bedroom. Ruta said that when she finished making breakfast, she brought the food to Diddy's bedroom and not first and then entered to set up the meal. Upon entering, I noticed Mr. Combs and his guest indisposed and engaged into hanky panky. So she talking about, listen, he told me that I better prepare the meal. And he had Gina over there, the girl that we talked about yesterday. And she said by the time she was done with the meal, they was getting it on like Donkey Kong. And she had to be subjected. And her poor eyes had to see his big beefcake, little beefca beefcake, or his medium-sized, pinky-sized beefcake ramming it into Gina. But I, I heard the part about the putting in the car, and that's the same sh that when Kirk Burroughs wouldn't sign over his rights to Bad Boy, his 25%, that he was threatening to do Kirk. Like, yo, yo, put the out nigga, put that nigga in the car and drive him around. <laughs> so I could see him doing that sh with the putting in the car stuff, but I, I, don't, I don't see him killing her. For the for the article and all that, bro. But to put her in the car or something like that, I could see him saying that to her. So that's something that he told the Kirk Browns too, then. Yeah, yeah, he told Kirk Browns that when he was threatening with them baseball bats. <laughs> What's the story with that, yo? I think it was like Kirk had to sign over Bad Boy. His, his, he had like twenty five percent of Bad Boy, but for them to get the deal, it had to be. Everything had to be in one lump thing. Like somebody couldn't owe twenty five percent. Somebody couldn't owe for Puff to do the deal. So Kirk had to sign over his shares in order for them to do the deal, which I didn't never understand. It wasn't my business to understand it. But Kirk ended up signing over it back to Diddy with the promise that he was going to get it back once they do the the whole thing with Clyde Davis and everything. And uh, uh. 
Kirkwood had to be threatened in order to do it. And that was with the, uh, it was no real baseball bats. You know those mini baseball bats you get from the, uh, from the games back in the day? Those little short baseball bats, they used to give them back in the day when we was growing up. I don't think they do that anymore. You know, so um, thread and Puff, Puff threatened Kirk with that, a couple other dudes, and told me, you're going to take this long ride or you're going to give up that, uh, that percentage of, your, of the company. And that's when Kirk Burroughs, he signed it over, he was scared? Yeah, he was scared. What else he going to do? Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, to hear that from you, you know, that confirms it. Because when people hear this, they start to believe that, you know, it's being made up and, you know, people going overboard with the lies. But, you know, to hear that from you. Yeah, I know, bro. That's, that, and that's the whole thing about it is, is that. But then, you know, some people, they go by faith and some other people go by sight. You know what I'm saying? I live by faith, brother. See, nobody believed he was the man that he was until they seen him running down the hall, throwing that little girl against the wall, throwing her on the floor, and start kicking her like she was somebody's soccer ball. They had to see that to believe the evil in him. So when I tell these stories, they don't believe. And, and some of them are, yeah, I heard, I'm there. Yo, I come, I have Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. When I come to work, when I come to work, yo, Gene, this what happened. Yo, Gene, did you hear that? God, Gene, da 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 da. I'm looking at this nigga like, for real? Wow. So now everybody think that because I talk about it, that I was a part of it and I saw it. Not everything. That we had to rub some cats up there. I'm, I'm for that. Back in the day, I'm for that. Whatever. Soon's Rendezvous was gladiator school for me. I love that, especially when dudes start talking that stuff and what they gonna do. I was a, that's a younger part of Gene. When we doing them parties, I'm at the front door and dudes are talking that smack. I'm for that. That was a younger Gene. These are just stories of my life. It's a difference. So when Puff did some of those things like that, yeah. But I'm not going to be involved in them hurting somebody's daughter, drugging somebody's daughter, or raping somebody's daughter. Not Gene Deal. I got daughters of my own. I got sisters. No, you're not doing that. So when these guys make up that shit out here on these content creators and want to believe this and say this and say that, you can make your mouth say anything.